Welcome to the Lost Signals Discusses Literature, where we apply the revolutionary mutt skill to classic and contemporary works of prose. So, join us once again, won't you? Hello, and welcome back to the Lost Signals Discusses Literature. Um, today, we're doing an older short story. Uh, from 1968, uh, one called The Daughters of the Moon by Italo Calvino, uh, an Italian story. Uh, I'm going to be your host, Steve Ramosi, joined today by Christopher Morgan. Good evening. Scott Thurlow. Call me Moonbeam. And Ian Manzer. <laughs> Hi, all. I'm sorry, Jonathan Ian Manzer. I don't know hey. why I left off the Jonathan there. Hey. Uh, all right, so we, we've got uh, dueling... Log lines, which we don't know what each other's log lines are as of yet. So go. Mine is going to be freak out in a moonage daydream. Oh, yeah. In the year 2525, <laughs> if the moon shall still survive. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, that's close. I like both of those, my friends. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Uh, well, in that, in that case, uh, let's get started. Ian, uh, why don't you start us off with the plot? In the way that a person might attempt to describe their dream to you, and I would argue as engaging as someone this, might this describe. This story is their, very dreamlike. Uh, I'll back that up, yes. In the distant future, the moon is acting wacky. Oh, actually, I should say, consumerism has conquered the earth. And the one last remnant of kind of drudgery is the moon. And Which is disintegrating. Our protagonist meets uh, Moonbeam Daydream Girl, uh, <laughs> Mary Pixie uh, Moonbeam Girl, uh, who uh, is naked and worshiping the moon, but the moon gets dragged down to earth by machinery and then uh, floats away, but it goes and it arises as a. Uh, Another green moon yeah, arises uh, and so forth. Yeah, so that happens. See a green moon horizon. Yeah. Green moon rising yeah. <laughs> on the right. I don't know if I got the story. Uh, it is very trippy. Uh, I understand the thematic elements of this, but I would like to hear someone explain to me what happened during the plot. So you're right. It is very dreamlike, <clears throat> and I think I, I mean it's sort of like ingrained within the story itself, it, within style and so forth, and uh, themes as well. And so, the, um, I guess as a, as a quick note, like the funny thing to me is that like it was uh, published in the New Yorker in 2009. So I assumed it was like near and around then, but originally it was from 68. So upon knowing that, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Like that's, is much more fitting. Like uh, it, it, it was upon reflection, uh, a story of its time of, of like, you know, of that era. So you're mm -hmm. right. Like, it is very dreamlike. It's very like hippie-ish. I have it uh, written down. Like, sure, maybe, but like, like I, I kind of like liked it. Like it, it was easy to follow along. With. It, it wasn't like difficult to understand. Even if it was like had that dream, like you know, sort of surreal quality to it, uh, for sure. I mean, and also it's, it's a quick enough story. It's, it's pretty short, like in general. So I'm looking at a, a pretty strong two. I, I had two slash three. Like possibly I could go up to a three. I just thought like. For what it did, like it, it moved you along. It had like, you know, maybe three movements to it, if you will. And I, I was pretty engaged uh, with it throughout the entire time. So given that, like, that's where I pretty much stand. So what do you guys think? I'll actually say I, I very much like this story. It put me in the frame of mind of like, um, like an old world myth, right? And like, yeah, yeah. Like sure. a new old world myth, like, like a creation story or something like that, that you hear out of like, um, it almost felt like a, like an African creation story or something like that, or like, or, um, you know, an Asian story or something like that, you, you know, just like old or even European really like those old stories they hear that like are just, uh, tales that don't really make any sense, but are about the creation of something new. Right. And this is like that creation of something new told. And, and honestly, something I almost missed 
is that this is actually a history, right? Like uh, the first couple paragraphs are about like, oh, I've seen many moons die or like, you know, I, I've seen many moons in my day. And like, let me tell you about my most recent one. What happens yeah. when uh, or was, I've seen loads of moons, seen them being born and running across the sky and dying out. One punctured by hail from shooting stars, another exploding from all its craters, yet another oozing drops of topaz colored sweat that evaporated immediately, then being covered by greenish clouds and reduced to a dried up sh spongy shell, right? Like, so it's this story of like these beings, whatever they are, named QFWFQ, however you pronounce that, uh, <laughs> telling, the, telling the history of like moons and like how they go. And like, I, I think that's really interesting. And I, 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 did, I, I did really enjoy reading this. It does feel like a dream. You're absolutely right. But um, in that same way, that's, that's quite, kind of what I liked about it. It's like, it's kind of um, trippy feel. I'm probably going to give it a, a strong two. I don't know if there's enough in it to like be a three um, in terms of plot, because not a ton of plot actually happens, but what's there I think is strong for me. And, and, and I, and I do, I, I have a strong feeling of like being there and seeing some kind of like transformative event when I'm reading this uh, story. So I'm going to give it a two, I think. What do you think, Chris? Um, I think it kind of lost me two thirds of the way through. I, I felt at times it got tedious I'd rather really save discussion about themes because I think that's the crux of it. I am, if I'm going to give it, I'm definitely, I'm but probably because I followed it before it got two thirds before it got tedious. I would probably give it like a soft two, but you know. So you went two out of three parts of this story before it lost you. So you can give it a two out of three. Get to the ending of it. I mean, Chris is well versed in having naked women drive in the back of his car. So uh, <laughs> that's how I got through college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not but, Steve. Oh, your point on it being a creation myth is actually very sound. Uh, I've, while you were talking, I was reflecting back on many of the myths I know. And a lot of myth is practical. It's about going back and like, this is how we store fire. And we're going to wrap a narrative around it. But creation myths have a, I have a, you go back to the, the waters above and the waters below yeah. and uh, like, uh, whales descending as led to. And this does have that feel of uh, people attempting to describe something that they're Explaining. not 100% yeah. sure of what it is using the language they have at their grasp to display it. And on that Level. A lot of that will go into my reflection of style, which I might have given a zero to prior, but now I might give it a one. But I think that, yeah, for that mythological part, I might have to give it a two, as you're right about that. Yeah, I think I'll concur. Like, um, I'll draw it back, but a, a strong two, but I'll set it on a two for plot. But did you say a two as well, Chris, or a one? I'm going to give it a two. Okay. Two thirds, like I said. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. I made that. I, I, yep. I railed against you on that. Uh, all right. Uh, so let's move on, Scott, to themes. So I think this is one of the stronger points of it. Like, so again, like it was interesting to me, like not knowing until after I like uh, came to the like the final like little, um, not even like stinger. Like it's not part of the story, but it was like it told you that it was originally from 1968. I was like, okay, that actually makes a lot of sense given for what it was saying. So yeah, it's it's um, a comment upon consumerism. You know, like Mother Earth is dying. Like it, it's all the hippie stuff. And like I'm not like using that in a derogatory sense it just like that's the heart of it it seems to me so like given that i thought yeah uh on top of the dreamlike qualities to it this the surreality i think it kind of worked like i enjoyed what it was getting at in a sense like yo mother earth is dying like you know mother earth wants us all to leave you know like <laughs> sure. humans are fucking up the planet and and even beyond that they're fucking up the satellite that surrounds our planet so like yeah, it ties into to the uh, folklore sort of creation myth thing that you guys just said. So on that front, I think it, it was stronger than not. So I'm leaning towards a solid enough one because I think it, the message itself was clear enough and came through, and maybe it ties into style a little bit, which we'll talk about later. But yeah, like for me personally, I think it worked on on the um, 
the platform of that message. And I think it, it came across. So I'm going to give it a pretty solid one unless you guys have some, something else to convince me of, of not to do that. So. So I, I think it's really interesting. I, I, I know, well, just from some extra reading about um, the author, he was at this time, and, and when he wrote this, he was, I think, the most translated Italian author yeah. of, his, of his day. And I think it's interesting that this is a story set in Manhattan um, based on consumerism. I wonder what the you know, import of that is that he's talking about like America um, as opposed to setting it in Italy or, or you know, whatever. I, I wonder that, that made me wonder kind of like, Oh, does he, has, has he been to America? Does he, I got the impression or is he just like, did. Yeah. kind of like talking about it from a, and, and you know, he, he kind of nails the idea of um, the slow consumerist, dissent yep uh you know long before a lot of people were thinking about that i th i think uh, i mean i, I guess i guess it's not, i guess it's not true that that was an era of uh, a lot of I mean, not long before people talking think, about that but like it it's still it's still a it's still a large issue that gets talked about a lot like now and um i think it th this is really like the his idea of the i want to put this i want to make this like like you said earlier ian um it's them talking about something that they are that they can't quite put their arms around in the terms that they have but like this this story goes even further where it goes back to like it kind of uses the language of of those myths of, of yesteryear, right? In talking about things that are happening <clears throat> at the time. And I think it does a really good job with that. And it frames, <clears throat> excuse me, it frames consumerism as like, that's like, that's the, that's the thing that we're trying to grapple with uh, in the same way that people are trying to grapple with like, why was, how was the world created or like, you know, what, where does, thunder come from or lightning or whatever you know like it's the same type of thing like consumerism is this like unknowable kind of entity like at, at at the highest level like this unknowable entity and and this is a story of like just dealing with it on kind of a, a like visceral level right like here's where my dreams take me when it when they take me to think about what's happening with consumerism or whatever it's interesting analysis uh one i would like to say that uh i knew it wasn't a modern story because i feel we're at the end of consumerism in a lot of ways uh oh uh, and i wonder if they any of those authors who are rebelling against consumerism would have traded for pandemics <laughs> and social isolation but uh on that note my issue with it is the absurdity of it and the surrealistic nature of it cloaked any greater message that I think the author had for this. I'm not saying that it's not drawn. Uh, other people couldn't draw it out of it. It was obscured for me. So I'm going to argue that the themes weren't strong for my, me personally, because of it's obscure. In the same way the moon's obscured. Like I, I get your mm -hmm. I get that angle, but no, I mean I'm still sitting <clears> with the one, but I, I do see that and I didn't I mean I wouldn't have thought about it um or at least got that reaction or, um upon reading it, but I see I see what you mean for yeah. sure. So I, I think it's interesting, like um I can see what you mean there, but there's also this like it is I think I think the theme is made like kind of um obviously you can, you can argue for yourself personally that upon reading it you drew stuff out of this. For me, upon reading it I get you. it it left Well what what uh, I mean what I mean is like for it. what I mean is like there are a couple points where it like states what it what it's trying to say. Like there's a there's a line the city had consumed itself at a stroke. It was a disposable city that now followed the moon on its last voyage. And like to me, that's like 
um, to you is the operative word. That that's that's, it, that's kind it, of the it theme, meant right? something to you. It meant nothing, uh, sure, or sure. at least the surface elements that I found in it were okay, it but it just didn't There's like. Yeah. Okay. It didn't uh, there were themes because he told us there were themes at times, um, and I agree with you, Ian. Um, for reasons we just, you know, about the end of consumerism. But I agree with you, the themes, there were a bunch of themes, but they never really gelled because I, I think obscured was a, a, was a great word to use because again, the story in a way got tedious for me. So I just, oh, okay, we're making this point now. Oh, okay, just, so now I'm gonna give it a zero. I see you guys points, but yeah, I, mean, I think it, it's interesting because it's sort of a personal preference or like your, your visceral reaction to it, but oh, yeah. I guess I was putting it. I'm not but... saying it's incorrect. I'm just saying that yep. uh, if I may be, there's, there's a certain limit to objectivity that could be like, I didn't understand it. Thus, it must be good or it must be bad. It doesn't, I'm going to give this uh, yeah, no. I subjective feel analysis of this. Interesting yeah. one, yeah. All right. Um, no, all right. On. So let's go on to antagonist. Chris, was there one? Um, if we're going to go along with themes, I guess it's consumerism. Um, I, <laughs> but the thing is, I think I think the um, I was going to bring this up in style, but I think this is probably a good uh, time as any. Is that there was a comic book um, called "Can't Get Now." Um, you read that? Yeah. I, I, Fucking yeah, a, dude. You and, I, you and I were passing it around, uh, and um, it, what I'm saying. It, it, it told an it told a narrative in a very similar fashion, but you could, with that, it could be the whatever was in the ether, nine eleven, the repercussions of it was the antagonist. But it really wasn't about being antagonized. It was just about uh, kind of a journey. I didn't really oh. I didn't really get an antagonist. I just kind of felt like this was an event happening, and here's this character going through it. So I don't really see an antagonist. I'm open to um, possibilities, but if uh, the antagonist is based upon the themes and I didn't give themes uh, credit for gelling, then, you know. All right, so I'll give you this. Uh, I'll throw this out there for you guys. Um, upon reading it, like about halfway through, uh, I, I thought of uh, a line from The Doors, of course, because, you know, from the same era. What have they done to the earth? You know, stuck her with knives in the side of the dawn. Like, that's sort of like... like that line like came to me so like yeah like i'm not sure how to cut this it's a difficult one to cut up for sure uh to your point chris because it's a comment on consumerism which we just discussed in themes so like what's antagonizing people like at least the characters in the story it's a little like uh like you said obscure a little unclear a little muddled i suppose so i almost could coin flip it but my gut wants me to say like a very soft, a super soft zero, if you will. But just because of that, but I'm not married to it, but that's how I lie. Like, that's how I view it as such, uh, at least as of now. So with that, that's what I'm looking at. But if you guys got, if anyone else has something else to say about it and convince me otherwise, or if you feel strongly differently, please let me know. Sivo, you're muted. <laughs> Unmute yourself, sir. Uh, I, I I agree with you, Scott. Uh, I I don't think that this story really needs a super strong antagonist. I think that it tells what it wants to tell, uh, just fine without really being without the main characters uh, being antagonized in in any way, other than like the I guess maybe the death of the moon is the antagonist, right? Like sure, but it's so broad, degree, right? Yeah. Like, that's the that's the you know plot really. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that it's fine with an anta the antagonist being a zero. Yeah, it's um, not bad. It's not like poorly done. But yeah, right. I mean, we've come across this before and it's not a fault of the story per se, but by nature, I think that's how I lie. Yeah, yeah it's not, you know, it's, it's a story of kind of the main character's almost discovery rather than like, uh, you know, being pushed by an antagonist to do something, and, and I, I'm going to give it a zero for that. But um, I don't, I don't fault the story for not having an antagonist. Yeah, you yeah know? exactly. Not that it sucks, but like again, like a Chris uh, by design, I guess, is a phrase we use a lot, and I think that is applicable here. So yeah, there's one element in this where he describes his antagonism, 
And the, before I get into that, I want to say the way I viewed this was Wally with the main character <laughs> from Brazil. <laughs> uh, and he and he describes the the fight against the social pressures of giving in to the mysticism mm. that uh and then he once he sees others also giving to the mysticism that kind of dis, uh disrages his fears oh. and so you're right it's like that's the only moment i saw him reflect upon challenges that might be to this it is and oftentimes creation myths don't have antagonists to them yeah, that's so, true. Like, yeah, yeah nature, exactly. That's the point of this. The, uh, the yeah. antagonist generally comes after the creation myth. Yeah, so, that's um, a really good point. I think that's more evidence, like, you know, just to lean towards a zero, but again, not <clears throat> a fault of the story, just by the nature of its design, that's how it shakes down. Mm. All right, so uh, that's zeros all around for antagonist, and so, yeah. it's going to be on me for protagonist. <clears throat> um, I like the protagonist in this. He, I assume, I don't know if it's ever said that. It's, it's a, never said. He, but uh, it, it feels like it's it, implied by that by his defense of, of the woman. woman. Yeah. yeah. Well, like yeah, like the the um, contrast with they're all women on the cars, which makes you assume that they're all men. Mm -hmm. uh, women on the cars, men in the cars, right? Yeah. Like, sure. That's kind of what you assume. Yep. Um. But I actually enjoy his like character arc in this. Uh, he kind of goes through a whole like thing <laughs> about like seeing what's happening, being like completely distraught about it, like kind of being in a hopeless state of like all these crazy things happen. I would never look at them, but this one thing, like this woman on the bench, made me stop and look. And then he gets into a whole like adventure because of that, that leads to him like following the moon and we all have our woman on the bench. In there. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but like, yeah, but I, but I think it's, I think it's a, I, I think he has a, an interesting story. He kind of changes in his thinking from start to finish. And I think it's a pretty, for, for whatever it was, like a 10 page story or whatever it is. Like, I think it's a pretty solid character arc and I, I, um, I gotta give it credit. So I'm gonna give it a one for, for a tag. Uh, it actually follows a uh, call to adventure fairly well. Right. Um, actually, certain elements in the kind of at the real state. That's states. definitely true. Sure. Uh, I view him more as an observer or a chronicler of, well, then you should have gone first instead of passing off to me, uh, uh, than a, uh, an active participant in the mysticism. But that's not a fault of, of a storyline, especially considering what it's attempting to do. Right. And more so than Alton Christian myths give you. Uh, he's audience surrogate as well, uh, and yeah, and it's no, interesting. Right. He's like the he's literally the vehicle for the yeah yeah people <laughs> that are like actually like doing things right, <laughs> which I think that's, I found fascinating. Yeah, so that stuff, all that's all that is true, but that's what sort of like tripped me up at least maybe at least initially originally because I felt like he he didn't really have a personality like or at least a bare bones one, but like that was by nature like by design again chris like as we say so like you don't even know his name but you do get the call of venture thing is a good point for sure and it ties into the the folklore like creation myth as we said uh on the outset so like i i had a default zero like written down like a softer one for sure but now i'm sort of wavering upon it because of the points you guys just made i just feel like like the protagonist wasn't like the focal point of the story he was the, the surrogate like you said like he mm -hmm. was your audience pov like more or less steve the smartest thing you did was wrap this uh, uh in myth because now that I, does uh, change the angles for sure so this. so it's absolutely what, made, what it made me think of like throughout while i was reading it so yeah so i'm still unsure so chris what, what do you got on this one um as i said before a because there's an absence of a true protagonist and we're following a character through a series of events. I thought it was done effectively. Um, I, I did reference a, a graphic novel from earlier, whether or not I enjoy um, this, the ultimate story I do. It doesn't mean that the protagonist or the 
whatever you're supposed, you know, put your insert oneself into this. Whereas right. in a, um, so I'm I'm definitely giving him giving the protagonist a one. I, I right. I'll talk more about it when we get to style. All right, I think you guys convinced me. I think I will change over the line for a one on this one. But I was it, going into it is all I'm saying is like I didn't. But having talked it out, yeah, okay, solid. Enough. All right, Ian, what do you think about supporting characters? So, two arguments here. I don't necessarily believe the ones I'm going to say, but you have uh, the uh, his female companion. I forget her name. Diana. Diana. Like, he actually doesn't even know. He thinks it's actually Diana, Diana would be fitting for the Greek mythology. Right. But, uh, right. It's a good time. Uh, she's more of, in a sense, the nymph type characters or some kind of supernatural being the magical that, exactly uh he's in a sense who's both with him but also leading him uh in this mystical event and the other argument is that the world he's built and that construct is a secondary character itself I like that. however i don't know if and this goes back to our discussion on themes chris mm-hmm uh, I don't know if it all gelled perfectly for me to give it a one. So I wrote down one on my initial impression for secondary, but you're right. Like it's a little iffy, I guess. Again, having talked it out, having thought about it a bit more, I still think I might side with the one. Um, I do like yo. Know, she's she's essentially like yo know, mystical, like um supernatural uh help. Like more or less, right? Mm -hmm. Like she exemplifies both the cult of adventure and, in some way, is supernatural somehow because of the events of the story as, as they unfold. So, given that, like, I kind of, I do like that angle. Like, she might not be like a character like, unto herself or like ca like characterized, but what she, I guess, exemplifies, I think, ties in. Like maybe like pushes her her over the line, and also like her also like fellow uh, daughters of the moon if you will so like given all that like i guess as at this point i'm leaning towards a softer one but still one because of that but i, I you know i'm not tied to it so chris go, you go were on. looking around the room and distracting me <laughs> I, i'm sorry i'm really sorry about that i in case you're not watching i there was a bug crawling i mean i wasn't sure if it was like a wasp or a hornet <laughs> just trying to get a good look of it look at it as but to put my glasses on and it flew off and i'm like I'm trying to figure out the doors yeah. of the moon. Could be anywhere. I felt something land on me. I'm like, I'm getting. Uh, so, I, Ian, I apologize. I was going to. No, just. But. All good. But what do you saying, think about this question? Here's what I'll say about uh, supporting characters. I, I do, like, in the same way that um, I thought that the main character had a good arc, Diana, Deanna, uh, he mishears, he doesn't properly hear her name when she says it, but. um. Sure. I think he calls her Diana throughout the rest of it. She has this like arc of her own where she becomes like the queen of the daughters of the moon, I guess, or whatever. Like you see this entire thing unfold and like, she kind of has her own storyline that you kind of have to, uh, you know, it, it's not told, but it's like, shown like here's here's what the main character sees they don't actually talk but like she goes after the moon and like she ends up being in front and then she's kind of the one that's like at the forefront of everything so i, I see her i see her having like a, a bit of an arc there um and then i guess outside of that i would say that the moon is a supporting character i like that actually. um it has like the moon has probably the strongest arc of of anything in this of anything in this like it goes through like physical literal physical changes uh as as it goes on through and and kind of like falls and rises again at the end and like that that is a that is definitely a mark of like a a myth story right like a, a, a oh, you're right yeah creation story something mm -hmm. or not even creation but like uh you know a, a mythical story a myth of, of some sort of, yeah yeah almost a god like right you see the moon is like this god that like f falters and then rises again at the end and like r rises back into the sky 
with and takes some of the some of the daughters with it and like they they look at it every night now and they say like oh, i forget what the end of it is exactly but it's like you know they're like oh there they are again or whatever so i, I really love mm. that and and if if for enough for no other reason i'm gonna give supporting a one for the moon i think mm. i was actually gonna give it a zero because to me um diana or uh, diana was uh, i'm going with the you know observer through events was just uh part of the scenery that he had an interaction with for a brief time and then followed but the moon makes a very interesting supporting character um mm, that that's very that uh that kind of threw a wrench in my works Ian, do you have anything to i don't buy it i putting what my uh, the moon into style okay and i think that's not fair too. character driven because i'm not even sure if it's the moon it could be a satellite it could be a balloon it could be many things that actually make more sense than i don't know the creation myths aren't supposed to make sense but the fact is that or it's supposed to be metaphorical. some sort of sense but right. yeah i got you but there's anything about metaphorical characters are, are, aren't ones that have arcs in their own. They're meant for messaging. So with themes failing in my assessment, and I'm going to put the intrigues of the moon's corkscrew through the sky as part of style. So I'm going to give it a zero. I'm, I'm right with you, Ian. Good point. I'm talking with you, Steve-O, like, Maybe just over the line, but I think it does work enough. Again, over the line. Yeah, but like <laughs> I guess you know, as you said, like personally for me, like my interpretation, I think is enough for a one for a secondary. Like Diana and the Moon, and like the other daughters as well. Like you know, of course, like you know, beneath them, but still enough collectively for a one. So sure, sure. All right, uh, Scott, keep talking dialogue. This one's a little uh, easier for me. Like I think I'm, I wrote down zero and unless you guys have something to say about it, like there, A, there isn't much of it. It's more, again, it's a dreamlike, surreal, like, you know, sort of um, re, you know, retelling of uh, an event. And there's not much interaction even between the characters. So again, it's, it's not a fault of the story. Don't get me wrong, but just for what the way it's structured, um, which we'll get to in the next question, but, in terms of this question itself, I, I think I'm looking at a soft one just by nature, just by design, again, so forth. Like, I know I'm probably overusing that term, but I can't help it because that's what it seems to me. Like, that's my impression of it. And uh, I think it's just, it's not the point of it. Like, it, the, the other points we said were stronger. So dialogue-wise, if you will, I'm looking at a zero. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I probably agree, too. There's not much dialogue, and it's not the point of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's there. The the point of this is to tell a... Uh, a modern creation myth, really. Surreal, like, almost, yeah. you know, yeah, a surreal myth, right? And, like, the, the dialogue is there to prop it up from time to time, but it's not super important. It, like, this yeah. this this story literally could have been told without dialogue and it would have been the same thing it almost is that that's what i'm saying right? yeah you know i mean so i i'm gonna give it a zero not for any fault of the story in my mind but like just there's not much dialogue there and what's there isn't memorable or like it's not important to the story really again i think that's intentional so that's where i lie yeah <laughs> same <laughs> ian shrugged for all of for, for all of you listening at home he shows it in a generally agreeable manner. All right. So Dallas and his zeros across the board. And Chris, tell us about style. Um, I, I think style is actually the strongest part of this. While I agree, always feel like every step of the journey and execution was successful. It, this is in its own right. Um, a road story. This is a road movie. You know, it's, um, and I do like these, even when, like I said, it, it takes, you'd really have to fail miserably for, my, not, for me not to like a story of this, at least on some level. <laughs> uh, I, do, um, I do think, uh, as Ian said, I think, uh, I'll let Ian talk about the moon more with regard to style. Uh, but, it's, but as far as dialogue goes, I think, and I'm, 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 this is the first thing that came to mind, so I'm bringing it up again, is can't get, no, there was no dialogue. I don't think there was anything. I think it was all told pictures. 
And I, I'm like, you know, so I, to me, if the picture's that vivid, I barely, I didn't really remember any of the uh, dialogue at all. I'm like, oh yeah, there's two lines. Okay. So I'm giving it a one. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it is the strongest. Like it was again, very dreamlike. And I know, I, I know, I, like, I can't help but like, reference um the earlier like greats like if you will like bradbury like i any story that like in any superficial way resembles a bradbury story like i'm gonna like say like oh remind me of that and i don't think it's like you know a direct ripoff or or one-to-one or anything like that but it's still i can't escape like the trappings of it so like and yeah like i thought it was engaging i i did it it got me along uh quite well throughout like chris you said it was like a little bit tedious for you at the end. Like I did not actually feel that. I thought the style again um, was relevant to uh, other questions that we said. And yeah, it, it, it was perfectly fine and I liked it and I'm going to give it a pretty solid one overall. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think that it was really strong. There's like, there are these really like, visceral moments throughout this that mm-hmm. like i could almost see right like yeah um the visuals the descriptions like, were quite nice there, there's one point where the where it's describing like he's like following behind her not touching her but like ready to catch her if she falls while she at the same time is like following the moon ready to catch the moon if it yeah, falls yeah. that's like that really stuck with me like there's there's a the moment with the highway full of cars with like yeah, that was naked cool, women yeah. on top of them, right? Like, and he just like looks over and it's like they're everywhere. Like the same thing that's happening to him is happening like all over the it's place. It's some hippie shit, but heavy like, metal. It worked. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, it, it felt heavy metalish. Yeah, like yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, cool. Like the moon, like rising up out of the sea with like the seaweed trailing off of it. Uh, the crane pulling the moon out of the sky, just like stuff like that was really yeah. like affecting to me in terms of like these really visceral moments that were described in such a way that like I could almost see them. And I think that like, that's why the style was so good and so affecting to me. Um, but yeah, anyways, spot on, yeah. spot on. I agree. I agree. I want to go back and reread this as a creation myth. Uh, and I think I will appreciate it more so for that. On that run. But I've been, uh, as you guys were talking in the past thing, since you mentioned it really, I've been going over, because I've studied myth formally uh, prior to this. And I, I'm, I'm, pairing what I know of that style with how they handle it here. And I think that, again, if this was the intent behind it, uh, it, it was handled very, very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to, if he's making a myth style, uh, like, on yeah, that, it's on uh, that angle. Yeah. I feel uh, a plus. Uh, all right. So that's going to bring us to recommend bring on home. With me, uh, yeah, I, I did. Oh, well, I did recommend this. I hadn't read it before. It just came up, and it looked like an interesting story. So I said, "Hey, let's all read it and uh, talk about it." And uh, I really did enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I think I'm perhaps one of the more oh, one, one of the ones that enjoyed it the most uh, of the four of us. But yeah, I, I really love this. I love the the. This is this is a type of story where, like, you know. I know that we in this podcast tend to favor um, I hate to say substance over style, but like, you know, the, a reading of the narrative over the style of the narrative. Uh, And this is the type of story that I, that, that is like, you have to kind of give over to the other side a little bit and, and say like, this is, this is about the style. Like that's where the substance comes from in, in terms of this story. And like, I really I appreciate that. that. Like every once in a while, there's something that like does that well, at least like hits me right in the right way. And like, that's the thing about something that's like very stylistic is like, it has to hit you in the right way. And when it does, like, that's such a huge thing. And, and I think with this story, it really did get me in the right way. And I get it. Like, um, that that's not going to be everybody's experience of it, but, but I really, I really loved reading this and uh, I'm happy that I, that I made it the one that we had to read. Even if none of you liked it uh, otherwise, I still would have uh, had a good time with it, but I'm glad that you guys got something out of it too. So I'm going to give it a one for recommend. No, I mean, I'm going to follow suit. Like I think I probably like it second most, I guess um, versus uh, Ian Chris, 
but yeah, like I, I do recommend it. It's a, a quick enough read and it is dreamlike. It's surreal. And like, I always personally like that kind of stuff anyways. And especially viewed from the creation myth angle, I think that adds a lot to it. Like if you go into it or like get that out of it, um, you know, look at it f- through that lens, if you will. And yeah, I, I think it is worth a read. So I'm going to give it officially a one and I will recommend it. Well, if you don't mind me saying, I've always found you guys style over substance. So, um, <laughs> I mean, that's always but, been the uh, case. I've never tried to hide that. <laughs> but my initial instinct is no. And even if I go back and appreciate this for how I think I will upon a rereading of it, I don't think the majority of people I would recommend this to. There's certainly a subsect of people I would, would or subset of a people. A smaller percentage. Uh, but yeah, uh, not enough that I would say to the general person, you should go out and read this. I'm going to follow suit with Ian. Um, like I said, it was good for what it was, but a, a lot of the depth of it, I just didn't quite, it didn't quite gel for me. And to be quite honest with you, I, I did keep referencing another work because to me that right. is something that, I mean, it was a different medium. They're both print, but um, I just don't think it didn't gel. Ultimately it didn't gel for me. So um, completely fair, my friends. Okay. I, just, I wasn't picking on it. I was just, no, I got you. Mm-hmm. Um, so given all that, sir, what do we if, got there? If I'm correct, that's going to be, uh, Scott and I gave it sevens and Ian and Chris gave it fours, which is a interesting yeah. wildly like, yeah. uh, th- th- this Divide. is, this has yeah. been a, mo- uh, a more divisive, uh, one than we've done in a long time, nice. uh, which I believe this is a five and a half aggregate score. And I think that's fine. Um, like, sure. Yeah. Obviously I would go a little higher with my seven, but like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I get it. I get where you guys are coming from. Run it so, to a six and you're good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that's going to do it for us with the Daughters of the Moon. Um, And hey, we'll uh, we'll talk to you later. I I have been your host, Steve Ramosi, joined tonight by Chris Morgan. Buenas noches. Scott Thurlow. Who wrote the Moon Wolves number one on my car? (laughs) And Jonathan Ian Manzer. I'm a son of Mars, so I'm kind of prejudiced. (laughs) (laughs) Have a good night. We'll see you next time. Editing and engineering by Stephen Hermosi. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates.